Um, thanks for having me here, everyone, uh, today. Um, thanks and acknowledgement to Clinton Brewer and Uncle Bob Dylan this morning for their welcome to country from the, com the sovereign Combermary peoples. I pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including those in the room with us here today. My very supportive advisor, Winsett Backhouse, Robert and Mal, and um, somebody else is here. <laughs> I can't see with the lights off. Everyone here. Hi. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the elders, knowledge holders, and peoples from the nations and traditional owner groups listed here. Some are in the room today. That's you, Mal. Um, <clears throat> I'm grateful for the time, knowledge, and stories they have graciously shared by participating in this research so far. And thank you for sharing your country with me. So I'm presenting from my PhD research on transformative approaches to engaging with First Nations people in environmental governance in ways that enable their agency and authority. Um, I know I sound like I was born and raised in far north Queensland, but I am from Jamaica. I'm not Australian, and I'm also not an indigenous person. So as a non-indigenous person doing research on indigenous stewardship, I'm not here to define or discuss the parameters of indigenous law or LORE, nor to analyze how these may manifest through reef governance. I'm interested in potential spaces of opportunity for traditional owners within the varied power structures and formations that operate in this arena. Um, we heard this morning about how ecology is culture and the reef is a living biocultural landscape. And in this excerpt from the Healing Country Statement by the traditional custodians of the reef, they emphasize that threats to the reef are threats to culture, identity, knowledge, language, and kin for the 70 traditional owner groups who uh, have enduring connections to their sea country. So in response to these unrelenting pressures and threats, Restoration is now a priority response for the reef and its connected ecosystems. There's a lot going on there and a lot of money and interest. Uh, there are unprecedented levels of intervention by uh, scientists and reef managers and the Reef 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan prioritizes the protection, rehabilitation, and restoration of habitats and heritage sites. This brings attention to the role of traditional owners in the restoration and management of sea country given their ongoing and inherent rights and obligations to lead and undertake these activities, particularly given the many ways that restoration and conservation as advocated by environmental science have perpetuated unique harms against First Nations people. And Libby and Harry uh, shared some examples of that this morning. So, reef traditional owners' inherent authority over their traditional estates is limited in several ways. We heard from uh, Robert and Jess now including the very layered legislative and policy framework regulating the reef. This is a framework that has been slow to recognize and integrate the complex knowledge systems, values, rights, and interests of saltwater peoples for sea country to support decision-making in contemporary maritime use and management. This image uh, shows the primary intersecting pathways through which traditional owner rights and interests for land and sea are currently recognized. So those are the areas in uh, green and purple. And some of these include formal and informal agreements. So in the Reef 2050 plan and the Reef 2050 traditional owner aspirations report, they both promote agreement making as a strategic plan to increase opportunities for traditional owner co-management and co-governance of the reef, particularly through rights-based approaches. Uh, Langton and Palmer here with this quote on the screen suggests modern agreement making has power to address past injustices and negotiate improvements on existing social injustices. So through agreement making, traditional owners and parties can, or there is potential for them to co-construct approaches to reef stewardship. So my research explores how power relations infuse and mediate the process of agreement making to support First Nations led restoration and stewardship of their sea country. Um, in my research, I do reject the view of power as just oppression or as exclusively located in positions of privilege. Rather, power is and is in relationships wherein privileged and disadvantaged positions simultaneously endure and exercise power, which creates many possibilities for resistance. My favorite thing. So the research is qualitative, the broad strokes of which you can see on the right. Uh, so I've been talking with reef traditional owners about one of these uh, agreements known as traditional use of marine resources agreements, or TOMRAs, we can use an abbreviation now. And these are voluntary, agreement, voluntary agreements that formally recognize traditional owner law and customer. 
They are three-way agreements between traditional owners, the Reef Authority, and the Queensland Department of Environment, Science, and Innovation through QPWS. And they're place-based co-management agreements that describe how reef traditional owners wish to manage their sea country in accordance with their rights and responsibilities under their indigenous LORE law. So the map on the left shows the 10 tumors that are currently in place with 18 traditional owner groups up and down the reef uh, or the marine park. Um, so you just follow the yellow boxes and the red arrows and you'll see. And they cover about 43% of the marine park coastline with others in development currently. I'm sorry this image is not so clear, but now I'll share some of my very preliminary findings from my research. I'm still in the process of data collection. So when asked about power, among many other things, the knowledge collaborators in my study all said it means having a seat at the table or having a say or in decisions that are made about country or having a voice. When asked about barriers to decision-making control over their country, many, many refer to the complex matrix of legislative and regulatory constraints, chronic under-resourcing to undertake work on sea country, lack of cultural capacity and competence in potential partners, and lateral tensions that arrive, arise from harmful judicial processes, such as those that we have seen in the past coming out of the native title process. When asked about Tomras in the context of these barriers, challenges, and power, participants offered that Tomras provided one key benefit, and that is the joint recognition of rights by both Commonwealth and state management agencies. This recognition alone will not and does not eliminate barriers, but arguably places traditional owners in a stronger position to influence change through the relationships that they're building, as we heard about today with from Vincent and Mal. And that change is reflected here. This is a timeline of significant events in land and sea management achievements on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, sorry, again, that it isn't very clear, but TOMRAs are one of these achievements that you can see in one of those red boxes. And there are quite a few dots on this screen. So participants mentioned TOMRAs can and do contribute to more active and, active and effective partnerships and enable traditional owners to act as joint custodians in guiding restoration and sustainable use as a part of their obligations. Obligations, by the way, that precede the original formation of the marine park in 1975, somewhere in these colors, <laughs> as well as the violence and dispossession from uh, British colonial invasion and settlement at the start here. Two minutes. <clears throat> we also talked about aspirations, and notwithstanding differences in local languages, cultures, economies, and histories, there were common responses, and some are listed on the screen. Uh, when asked about their aspiration in relation to Tomras, again, there were similar responses. Tomras are a tool, an important building block. One traditional custodian said, quote, Tomras give you the ability to build a foundation to springboard off of because you have to make your foundation strong. It cannot be a house of cards, unquote. They also mentioned that Tomras provide an avenue for traditional owners to strengthen or in some cases re-establish their collective decision-making institutions based in their LORE and contemporary cultural governance structures. They state that the success and failure of managing and caring for country is directly tied to having strong governance arrangements, and strong governance leads to new opportunities. There are also examples of traditional owners who have leveraged additional benefits through the legal effect of TOMRAs, and we have heard about that from the Wapabara uh, representatives here today, um, Harry and Robert. So tamras are a key component of sea country planning and governance that go beyond the management of turtle and dugongs, which is the most common association in some cases. So tamras, they are an example of a legislated arrangement built from the ground up with traditional owners. The model represents a critical paradigm shift within an environmental management authority to collaborate with First Nations people based on recognized rights. Yes, Tomras are embedded within hierarchical power structures as legacies, legacies of the settler colonial project and have received criticisms for being top-down, limited funding, divisive, and disempowering traditional owners where Western biodiversity objectives are the stated priority. But, or and, traditional owners strategically use Tomras and other agreements to progress their cultural and political autonomy in a contested space. Through this research, I'll further explore how traditional owners are establishing new relationships to write new chapters and put more dots on the timeline we just saw. And this will bring attention to issues of equity, justice, and decolonization in reef governance, 
with important implications for Australia's compliance with national and international obligations, as you see on the screen, including Closing the Gap, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Thank you. <laughs>